Hello, everybody. This is Cardwell Lynch and the C Sigma Show, and I have a really special guest. I'm very excited. Um, we're going to talk about I guess, two of my favorite things, really, lately. One, uh, silver. I'm a big silver bull. And uh, lately, the cryptocurrencies. We're going to dabble into that a little bit. But on my show today, I have Gregor Gregerson. He is the founder of Silver Bullion. It's a uh, precious metals dealer and also the founder of the safe house of vaulting or storage, uh, I guess, arm uh, of silver bullion. So uh, Gregor Gregerson, welcome to my show. I appreciate you taking the time from Singapore to talk to me. How are you today, this evening in Singapore? Oh, I'm, I'm great. I'm glad to be on your show. Oh, it's, man, I'm, I'm very, very pleased. Like I said, silver and cryptocurrencies, you know, I'm really into that. Um, I've been into silver for about, I'm going to say, I probably, I bought silver in that, what, 2011 year. And I remember buying it above $50 with premium and pretty much, you know, generally I've been adding to my stack ever since. So I've endured what a good, what uh, a seven, eight years of a pain after that <laughs> April CME drive by margin hike thing. What? Uh, I'm sorry I rambled there because I'm still a little angry like probably most silver owners are. <laughs> but uh, Gregor, tell us um, tell us how you got into silver. How did you found, uh, how you founded Silver Bullion in the safe house? You know, tell us your story because it's very interesting. Well, uh, you know, as mentioned uh, earlier when we were talking, I'm quite international. I lived about eight years in Germany, 12 years in Italy, 12 years in the U.S., 10 years in, in Singapore now. But uh, to me, I had a big aha moment in 2008. Um, at the time, I had already moved to Singapore, but uh, I was working for a German bank in Singapore, and they actually made me fly to, to Frankfurt, to Germany, to work on a project for three months. And around that time, uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, mm -hmm. and so I ended up being in the trading room of one of the biggest banks in Germany, second biggest actually, uh, in the aftermath of Lehman Process. And so that was a really, really interesting experience because you sort of see what happens when the financial system is getting close to a standstill. Oh. And I think what it did for me is, uh, you know, a lot of your readers probably are interested in finance, uh, understand counterparty risk and see sort of concepts, mm -hmm. but it's all something that's sort of in your head. It's like intellectual thing. Right. Uh, when what I had in 2008 standing in the trading room was actually seeing the system potentially collapsing. And that kind of hit me, you know, a lot deeper than normal. And uh, I realized at that point, a lot of you were going out and buying gold and silver physical gold and silver. And by the time I decided I'm going to go and see if I can get a bit of silver, uh, because at the time I was reading Mike Maloney's book, you know, investing in gold and silver, and uh, silver made, made a lot of sense to me. Uh, by the time I went out to buy it, the bullion store told me that they're not selling any silver or gold, they're only buying. And I thought, well, that was weird. So let me go to a proper bullion dealer, so I went to a different one, and they told me the same thing. And then I went through 12 different uh, bullion dealers and banks in Frankfurt and I, nobody had any physical. And yet silver and gold at the time, I don't know if you remember, but it kept on falling. Silver went as low as 950 at the time. Uh, but there was a complete shortage of physical. Um, I eventually managed to get uh, one kilogram silver bar at the gift shop of the European Central Bank. And... I had to pay 19% sales tax in, in Germany at the time, uh, but I had my bar and I took this bar and I flew back to Singapore and I declared it, which meant I had to pay another 7% going into it, into mm. Singapore. But I declared it because I wanted to understand the system and, you know, because I, I realized that when the provable shit hits the fan, mm. uh, it's going to make a big, big difference whether you're a creditor to some institution which might not have any gold or silver or whatever it is you're uh, they're owing you 
or whether you can actually hold or be the legal title owner of such gold or silver. And so I figured that we're going to have a bigger crisis coming because the reason for the first crisis, the debt, the leverage, and so on, all of a sudden is getting worse since 2008. So by the time the next crisis comes, I want to be in a safe jurisdiction, mm. which uh, Singapore, I believe it to be the best jurisdiction for gold storage worldwide. And I want to be legal title owner of physical gold and silver. And no matter what happens, I want to make sure that I can hold on to that gold and silver. So I look at it as a type of insurance against what's called systemic risk, about the system itself falling apart. And, you know, we are looking at things like nationalizations uh, that happened in the past in the U.S. We're looking at capital controls, which might be happening again. We might be looking at mass bank failures oh. and so on and so on. So we're kind of creating a storage solution which is specifically designed to protect clients and my own money, since I keep it there, uh, gold and silver, uh, against these sort of events. You were kind of what you were talking about. You're there basically witnessing a, you know, a, a car accident with the, you know, global economy and, and banking system, watching it seize up in like, like, uh, if you remember, I guess pretty much everybody's seen the big short, how they were kind of there when, you know, people are walking out, but you know, they're there witnessing the closing of maybe it was Lehman or something. And then you figure out basically gold and silver was going no offer either they didn't have it or they weren't selling it even though it was the paper price was crashing but you couldn't buy it at that price pretty much yes and you know this brings up a very interesting point because uh in the, since we started silver bullion in singapore back in 2009 uh we've had three periods when we ran out of silver to sell and typically, that's when silver falls. So what tends to happen is the price of silver is not determined by physical demand. It's determined by future contracts right. in COMEX and so on and so on. And uh, every now and then, you would have a very sharp drop in silver prices. Uh, for example, so uh, I think two and a half years ago or so, um, silver fell from around Twenty nine to twenty three dollars in a matter of a week or two, so it's a very very sharp drop, and there was no real underlying you know fundamental reason for it to fall like this. Uh, and you would notice that the fall will always start on a Monday morning, Asian time, and it will start around that time because that's when you have the least amount of contracts being traded, mm. so it's the easiest time to push the price down. Correct. And when the price starts falling like that, then people who, especially the small players who might have long positions, meaning who have bought paper silver, uh, they will end up being uh, getting margin calls because you know they're starting to lose a lot of money, mm -hmm. and eventually they're going to have to sell uh, because uh, you know the position is losing and losing and losing, and as they sell, it's pushing the price down, the price down further, and. Uh, as that happens, we have an interesting phenomenon because the price keeps on falling. In this case, it was up to 22 or so when it stabilized. Uh, but the physical buyer, the physical buyer does not buy on, on uh, you know, leverage. He has to pay for the whole thing. And the physical buyer always sees that as a buying opportunity. So we as a bullion dealer, we end up in a situation where the price of the product we sell keeps on falling and the demand of physical keeps on going up. And so that means we're going to get shortages. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same situation for gold, but the gold market is much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know, for silver, you just get so much for your money. I mean, uh, it's a gold-silver ratio around 75 to 1 now, yeah. which means that uh, once you have, you know, 50, 60, 80 million going into silver, that's already starting to train the physical supplies of silver because you're talking about tons and tons and tons and tons. And... Uh, that's pretty much the pattern we see every time. And I would expect that once we go into a crisis and once we see physical demand going up, uh, we'll be running out of physical silver very, very quickly. And eventually we'll see something similar about gold. And maybe one example I like to always give people is the way the future markets work. If you are a trader and for whatever reason you think gold or silver ought, ought to be going down, 
if you have one million dollars, you can leverage that, um, and you can basically have a net short position of ten million dollars. So basically, you're selling in the market ten million dollars worth of fictitious silver. Mm -hmm. Now, take the physical buyer who's got a million dollars, and this guy is going to buy a million dollars of physical silver. Well, the net effect is that the bullion dealer or the supplier with the refinery might then hedge that and actually create a $1 million you know, long position. But the net effect is that's $1 million of buying power and that's $10 million of selling power of fictitious right. silver. Right. The net effect is you got $9 million pushing the price down. So the way silver and gold prices are determined nowadays have nothing to do with physical demand and supply. That's, that's great because that's exactly the issue I wanted to speak to you about today. And you just explained everything I want to know and want everybody else to know about the pricing of silver and, and gold. And as we talked briefly before we got on, uh, started recording, uh, we had Zero Hedge just today, hat tip to uh, Turd Ferguson at TF Metals, who uh, showed that at uh, 7.06 Eastern Time p.m., essentially a month apart, some algorithm dumped uh, a bunch of, like, basically did what you just said, dumped a bunch of contracts on the market, and, uh, you know, silver fell, like, the wa not even waterfall, it's just, it's just straight down. And, mm -hmm. you know, basically, if somebody asks you, what's the chances of, at the exact time, roughly a month later, you know, this was to happen, you know, basically it's going to happen twice. What is that like? Like my, almost my uh, show sake, a six Sigma event. That's something that <laughs> probably shouldn't happen once in like a trillion years, let alone a month. Yeah. You know, the thing about silver is it's the smallest widely traded commodity. Hmm. So if you're going to these commodities, in uh, in comics and so on, silver will be the easiest one to push up or down, mm -hmm. to, to manipulate, so to speak. So uh, the problem is, what is manipulation? You know, how you define that? If a guy comes in and shorts silver for $100 million because he wants to push the price down and, you know, kick out all these smaller players which have long position, is that manipulation or is that fair game? I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of definition. And... Uh, but if you're interested, uh, I, I tend to write articles on things like this. And um, I wrote an article which compared our sales by month in tons of silver with the price of silver and gold. And it's exactly about this, this uh, phenomenon where if prices fall, you, we all, always have a big spike in sales. Right. And you can literally see the relationship between our sales for physical and the price of silver. Do you, uh, do, so you, sorry to interrupt. Do, do you find that um, as a, a cultural thing? Because it seems like people in the West, i.e., America, uh, UK, maybe even Australia, where I live, uh, they are they chase momentum up. Where uh, Asian uh, cultures love a bargain. Their favorite thing is on sale. They're like, you know, thanks for just dropping the price of, you know, silver or gold by hundreds and you know tens of dollars. Thank you. I'm going to go buy a ton. Is that a cultural thing, you think? <laughs> you know, not really. Actually, okay. I, I would say it, it just depends on the individual. Hmm. Uh, so plenty of people here in Singapore and China and the other places which, you know, say, they just want to go whatever is hot and whatever everybody talks about. Hmm. Um, but there's always a small number of, of people who are looking at fundamentals or who care to look a little bit more behind the curtain. Yeah. And... It's also the type of people who, who will buy uh, physical or who will really be looking at counterparty risk and, you know, try to understand how a system works and how to protect themselves. And having said that, you know, the majority of our customers are actually U.S. citizens. So okay. about 50 to 60 percent are from the U.S., uh, quite a lot of people from Europe. So um, over time, we developed our storage system and the P2P system in a way which is really appealing to the Western customer. Uh, more and more so so uh, most of our customers are actually from 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 the west so so how does that work you're living in say colorado you're like man i don't want to keep a, a port or i want to move a portion of my wealth in silver to a jurisdiction that's 
you know, out of, uh, say, you know, I don't know, the reach of maybe a, you know, a lockdown or a military, in a sense, uh, they call you, like wire money, whatever the, the funds get to you, they can, you can house it at your vaulting facility, the safe house. Yep. And uh, it, so there's a lot of precaution and things we've done differently from other companies. Mm. Um, and it will take me a while to explain it. But in the example you just gave, the person from Colorado will basically open an account with us, okay. which can be opened remotely. Uh, we do take U.S. citizens, which, you know, if you're trying to do that in Switzerland, it's very hard. Right. Um, and once their account is opened, you can either transfer existing bullion. So you could actually have bullion you have in the U.S. You could have it shipped over to Singapore. Uh, in which case we will test it on arrival uh, and then we will parcelize it into into packets and then you can you would have it stored here you can sell it at any point of time or you can get a loan against it if you want uh, the other option for you is to transfer money with a wire transfer and purchase uh, silver or gold through us which will then also be stored or the third option would be that you use uh, bitcoin and you purchase bullion through Bitcoin, for example. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> That's uh, that is awesome. It's amazing. I mean, there is out there in the YouTube uh, verse where you have precious metal bulls and, you know, silver only people just saying, you know, it's Bitcoin's a fad, it's a scam, it's tulip mania silver 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 but it's it's kind of like well if you're smart enough to make some money or wealth in cryptocurrencies as a silver lover you can join them both and join them both with you at silver bullion well well i can give you an, an example of okay. one of our clients uh he had about two million dollars two and a half million dollars actually of of silver with us and he decided to take a peer-to-peer -peer loan at around four per three and a half percent per year and for about 1.2 million and he took that money and he he bought bitcoins with it uh back in was around 900. Mm. so now it went way up right. and he's uh looking at, at maybe getting out of bitcoin now or a portion of that and buying some more silver with that money so you can do all of that um you can basically switch between bitcoin and silver and the silver that is stored, we don't go by an allocated system okay. uh, because when somebody stores silver or stores gold, there are different ways that this can be stored. And typically in the industry, you would often hear uh, fully allocated. Correct, I've heard that. But, yeah, fully allocated basically means that um, you're giving me $100 or say 100 ounces worth of cash and I'm supposed to be ordering a hundred ounces worth of gold to back uh, the liability you have towards you. But the problem is that gold is in my name. It's not in the client's name. I'm owing you the gold. So from a, from a legal perspective, that's not so great because you as a client, you have part, counterparty risk with us. And it also means that in theory, because the gold is in our balance sheet, we could go out and we could lease that gold or we could use that gold as inventory for a bullion store. And you know that's what happens a lot in the industry. So what, what we created with our storage system is what's called segregated ownership. And the way it works is we, our inventory, we have around 200,000 ounces of silver and around uh, 1,200 ounces of gold. And when you buy something, you actually buy gold or silver from our inventory, and that bullion goes into an individual parcel with a unique ID. And you buy that specific parcel. So parcel number 72552, for example. Mm -hmm. And you get an invoice where that parcel number is detailed. So it's uniquely identified. When you go into a storage facility, you will see these big um, pallet cages which are about 900 kilograms of silver each. And inside are all these parcels with unique IDs. Each customer owns one specific or several of these parcels. And that's how you can be an owner of something. 
because that bullion is not ours. Legally, we are just an agent who stores it for you, who creates liquidity for you if you want to sell it, and or are able to provide uh, um, uh, a P2P loan if you want to do this. We are kind of like an escrow, basically. But the customer is legal title owner of that bullion under Singapore law. And that, that is a, it's important because it means that if somebody takes it from you, it's called stealing. Hmm. And you know, it's a criminal offense and you basically go to prison. Hmm. Uh, if you are on a fully allocated system and for whatever reason your counterparty, your bullion dealer goes bankrupt, you know, good luck. Uh, you are just a creditor basically. So that's one of the things that we do different in order to protect the customer. I think there's a, I guess it might be a misconception that if you're fully, like you're getting it fully allocated at the Perth Mint or something that it's yours, you bought it and they're holding it. But what you're saying, that's not true. Cause that's what I always thought that when these guys say, oh yeah, you know, you, you know, bought it with us, it's fully allocated, it's yours, but you're saying it's not, that's not the case. Well, fully allocated just means that the company is holding some bullion uh, to cover the liabilities they have towards you. Okay. Yeah. A, a easy way of looking at it right. is, is if you have a certain number, if somebody owes you ounces, if you get a statement from them hmm. and it says that you have 102 ounces of silver, that's an IOU. Hmm. Because which silver is it? You cannot go there and point exactly, this is my silver. They have a stash of silver and they're saying of all these, say, 500,000 ounces we keep here, you have 102 ounces of that. But there's not any one bullion item with your name on it. So that's why you're a creditor. Mm -hmm. And that bullion is on the balance sheet of, the, um, of whichever entity is holding it. So the only way for you to be a legal title owner in a legal sense is for the bullion to be uniquely identified, either with a parcel or by a serial number, and that specific bar to be sold to you with an invoice. Because an invoice, you know, invoice doesn't sound that exciting, but it's actually uh, it's the way you transfer ownership. Just like when you buy, uh, you know, ice cream or something, or you buy something else. The invoice testifies that you are not the legal title owner. Uh, but if you don't have an invoice and you just have a statement, Hmm. That means you're a creditor, you see. Hmm. So well, if something happens to that, uh, to your counterparty, you can lose all of them. Wow. If something happens to us, uh, none of our creditors could take the bullion of our customers. Now, having said that, uh, we have about $10 million in assets in the company and we have zero debt. So we, we are very strong financially, but uh, it's just one way which... If you're store bullion, you know, you might want to look at it because when you are going to go into a financial crisis, um, you know, so weak players could, could go bankrupt. And if your counterparty is going bankrupt, you lose everything. Yeah, that, we've, we've seen that happen with, uh, account, with our bank accounts in Cyprus. Um, yep, yep. There, there's people in the way uh, of, of your money. So, yeah, having it, man there in a vault with you know with your name on it essentially this you know yes. that is yours that's that's some good yeah. uh, peace of mind right there well you know i always tell customers you should you, you ought to be asking four questions when you store bullion with somebody hmm. you ought to be asking how do you know it's actually there and the second question should be how do you know that same bullion wasn't sold to 10 other people and then the next question is how do you know it's real how do you know it's not you know, some tungsten with a bit of gold plating on top. And the fourth question is, how do you know that that bullion is not also being used, um, you know, as inventory or to be leased out, you know, to somebody else? Mm -hmm. So it's just sitting there. And if you if you can ask these four questions, and if you get a good answer for them, I think then you're safe. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, uh, you normally don't get good answers for that. And we basically build our storage system to answer those four questions from the ground up. And, you know, if you'd like me to go through it real quick, uh, how do you know the bullion is there? Well, 
everything is parcelized, like I mentioned before, this is unique parcels. You get a photo of the parcel and it's being audited four times per year, uh, once by uh, PricewaterCoopers, which is mm-hmm. one of the big well, uh, audit comp- yep, auditing global. companies. Yep, global. Uh, and three times by Bureau Veritas, which is uh, a company which uh, is a very, it's like a materials uh, testing and quality company, which does the LBMA inspection for vaults as well. And basically, so you get these reports. Uh, and of course, you, you you have, the next question is, you also get a photo. You get a specific photo for each one parcel that you have. Um, and if a customer wants to get an audit, he basically can come in and you know give us one day notice or something, depending on schedule of the vault. But you can basically come in, do an audit, or have somebody a third party do an audit for them. So that's how we create transparency to make sure the bullion is there. Um, how do you know it wasn't sold to multiple customers? Well, if you think about it, if you don't have a way of proving this, you could actually get say ten thousand ounces and resell these ten thousand ounces to ten different customers, and Whenever one of these guys comes, they will see all 10,000 ounces, but there will be multiple claims on it. So, uh, of course, if you're using an invoice system like we do, then it becomes a criminal method of doing that, which is a disincentive. But the way we create clarity with this is that we have what's called a parcel ownership list, meaning each one of our customers gets a list which lists each one of the parcels uh, that are being stored, and next to it is anonymous ID of the owner. Uh, which is an eight-digit number, which, and that list is made available to all of our customers. It's being audited by our financial auditors, uh, as well as the the vault auditors, and that basically ensures that we cannot double assign anything because the customers themselves would notice that the owner is not the correct one. That's how we address that issue. Um, when it comes to testing, all of the the third question: How you know it's real? All of the bullion that's going to our vault gets tested if it doesn't come directly from the refiner or from uh, the mint. So if somebody, say, from Colorado were to transfer in the gold, uh, we will go through a testing uh, system. And we developed a testing system called DUX, which basically stands for density, ultrasound, and X-ray, which is three to four different tests. And by doing these three to four tests, we can basically tell with a extremely high um, level of confidence that bullion is indeed genuine. And everything get transferred in, the test results all go into the system, it shows who did it, when it was done, and whether the bullion is is uh, genuine, and that can be called up online as well. So it's, it's a very transparent sort of system. And lastly, uh, because it's a segregated ownership system, we basically cannot lease it out and we cannot use the bullion as inventory, which is, you know, say, is a false point. So these are some of the things that our customer like about us. We basically tend to get, let's say, say, say financially sophisticated and, you know, the paranoid customers sometimes uh, who are going to have very specific questions and they want to have a good answer. And we basically spent eight years to make sure that we have good answers to their questions. And most of the time, we actually kind of end up telling them, hell, you should also think about this, this, and the other thing. And that's how, how we dealt with these sort of problems. And, you know, I myself, I guess I'm kind of paranoid because uh, mm-hmm. the more I learned about the industry, the more I realized that there's a lot of uh, corners being cut in the wrong place. Because when you buy gold and silver, and when you don't have it with you, uh, and you store it with somebody else, then you really need to make sure that that gold or silver is safe when a systemic crisis comes. Right. Yeah. Make people sleep well at night. You know. <laughs> yes. I mean, you live in like the states, and you're like, Jesus, I gotta sit my, you know, I'm sending it over to Singapore. You know, you really want to make sure that uh, you're just not shipping it off to some fly by night. Right. So I mean, it's a lot. Of, you know, it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of wealth. A lot of money. The whole thing is really about trust. Yeah, you know, in, in, in the company, I always tell everybody, look, I don't care about sales. I care about trust. Uh, if we can never, we need to build trust and we can never lose trust. Yeah. And that's why I tell all of our people, it's about creating trust. If a customer doesn't buy, it's fine. 
Now, six months from now, something might happen in the world where he's going to say, well, maybe I ought to be buying a bit of gold, and he'll probably come to us to do it, um, because at some point he will be ready, yeah. because he will trust us. And typically, whoever comes to visit us in Singapore, whenever people go to see the vault and get to see the details of how we do things, uh, they almost always end up becoming our customers eventually. Uh, and, but you know, everybody got their own sort of timing or their own uh, perceived need of doing it now or doing it later and so on. But it all comes down to trust. Yeah. So whatever we do, we can never take corners because that's sort of what our differentiator is. You know, a couple of days ago, uh, I don't know, like I guess you're, you're in Singapore, and I know the Bullion Star guys, uh, they're in Singapore, and Kuz Jansen who writes from them for them from uh, from uh, from Holland put a story out about uh, he estimates that Chinese gold reserves are 20,000 tons do you have an opinion on on that number of of, uh, of estimated Chinese gold you know I I don't follow that part uh, all that much because it's really quite hard to keep track of how much gold is there and there and you know you you can back calculate something here and there but yeah. to be honest we don't even know exactly how much gold there is in the world I mean the World Gold Council I think is, puts a number around 168,000 uh, tons or so but um, there might be a whole lot of gold which they don't know about um, you know we we are one of the uh, entities where contribute, we are telling Reuters uh, how much silver we are storing in aggregate to help them come up with their silver estimates and so on. But having talked with the guys who create these numbers, a lot of it is a guessing game. Mm. So, um, and you know, whether China has 20,000 tons or 25,000 tons, does it really change anything fundamental? In my point of view, I, I look at the amount of depth that the United States is creating. Mm. And where is that going to lead? I'm looking at the fact that there's say the unfunded liabilities in the United States and in Europe, you know, the pensions, the Medicare, and all of these other things. All these promises were made to the citizens, and there's no money to pay for it. So I'm looking at where things are going. And to me, all that matters is trust. Because the US dollar is only valuable because people trust it. The financial system only works because people trust it. And what happened to me in 2008 in Commerzbank was seeing that trust being, you know, put in doubt. And if there wouldn't have been the bailouts, you know, yeah. most people's money would be gone now because most of the banks would be gone. And that's what really matters to me. And if that happens, you better have some gold. And whether there's 5,000 more tons or 5,000 less tons in the world, it really doesn't matter. Because if you look at the amount of money in the financial system and the amount of gold in the system, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's there's so little gold and there's so much paper money out there that you just want to make sure that you have a bit of gold and you have a bit of silver as an insurance. And when that happens, you just want to make sure that that gold and silver is indeed safe. So that's kind of where I'm looking, where where my point of view is coming from. Could you speculate and just like what would make, I guess, the the these two markets of precious metals, of gold and silver? When is like science and math going to, you know, what's going to make that free these metals from, you know, from I, I would say the manipulation. You know, like, is it just going to be that the trust they can't hide anymore and, you know, they keep papering over it? Or, you know, if it's Italy, bad banks, debts, and we'll move it all to that bank and Italy's saved and Greece pops up and then it's saved again. Like, what do you think is going to make, you know, silver go from $16 U.S., which is crazy because it's high of 50 was in 1980 and... Now it's, you know, geez, what is that, like 80% uh, off its high? Or, you know, in this day, like you're talking about with all this record global debt, what's it going to take to f free these things? Well, you know, to come to the first part of what, what you asked, um, 
I don't believe in math or science to be able to predict what's going to happen in, in the financial markets. And the reason I'm saying is that I, uh, I have a degree in economics. I used to be very interested in econometrics. Um, I used to work for the structural product desk of a big German bank building derivatives. So I was actually working with the quants building derivatives. So I, I, uh, I have some familiarity with, with these you know, advanced mathematical uh, processes and so on that are being done. And I can tell you that uh, when you get too deep into these things, you try to believe in your models more than the real world. Hmm. The real world's economy is not based on something you can really model. It's based on the behavior of people. And in economics, you know, people make this assumption or they say, well, everybody ought to be knowing everything about everybody and everybody is making rational uh, decisions. But in reality, we obviously don't do that. So anything in these models, you know, is is really doubtful. So I, I don't really believe in in you know being able to predict things with with such numbers. What I believe is that there's basically a normalcy bias. In other words, yes. there are fundamental things in a system which can go wrong, and a system is either stable or it's unstable. Now, a stable system. Is a system where when you get a shock against it, it can naturally rebalance itself because there's always going to be some shocks coming. An unstable system is a system which once you you send a shock against it, it cannot right itself. It's, it's going to tip over. And what I'm seeing is that the financial system is becoming less and less stable. And the reason it's becoming less and less stable is because the banks that are making up a lot of these systems are very heavily indebted. They have a lot of bad debts on their books. For example, uh, we sold uh, property in Italy in 2006 uh, for about 2.7 million euros. It was about 20 apartments. Now, the bank, a consortium of banks, financed 2 million euros of cent. The buyer ended up going bankrupt and the property went back to the bank. Now, the bank was unable to sell it in 2010, 2011, so they just waited on it. They couldn't sell it for 2 million, then later they waited two more years. They tried selling it for 1.2 million, they couldn't sell it for 1 million, public auction couldn't sell it, 800,000 couldn't sell it. At 500,000, my dad bought it back last year. So this bank lost 1.5 million euros and got no interest. And this happened to two of our properties, not just one, but two. So when you look at Italian banks and you hear like, you know, Monte de Pasqui di Siena, for example, which is one of the bigger banks, it's actually the oldest bank in the world, if I remember correctly. Uh, If they were to mark to market all the bad loans they have, because real estate has fallen so much in Italy, they will be bankrupt. And if Monte de Pasqui di Siena goes bankrupt, many other banks which have relationship with the bank would also go bankrupt. Unicredito will go bankrupt. If Unicredito goes bankrupt, you know, maybe maybe Bayerische Finance Bank goes bankrupt, which will get Commerzbank into trouble, which will get Deutsche Bank, you know, underwater, which will get, Lumen, you know, <laughs> Morgan Stanley, and so on and so on. So it's like a house of cards. And if you remove the bottom cards, the whole thing falls. That's why banks are too big to fail, because if the wrong bank goes bankrupt, the whole system implodes. It's just that the system has gotten so big these banks have over one quadrillion in derivatives, you know, amongst themselves, which are basically bets. And if one of them falls, everything basically collapses. So last time in 2008, we had the government step in with bailouts and basically pay off uh, these companies and not just banks, you know, AIG was going to go bankrupt. They needed to get money from the government to survive. Mm-hmm. So if you have a life, uh, you know, um, um, a life policy, uh, life insurance policy with any of these, it's going to be gone if these guys go bankrupt. So uh, people think that, you know, you, you go with these big established names and you pay your whole life into it and some of you are going to have, you own something. You don't own anything. You're being owed something. Hmm. And if these guys get into trouble, it's all gone or a big chunk of it. And this time around, like you mentioned earlier, like Cyprus, governments are not going to bail it out because people don't like banks anymore. So it's not the political 
will to bail out bank, banks this time around with taxpayer money. Plus, it's getting too much. Governments are already so heavily indebted, where they're going to get some money from. So it's going to be a bail-in, meaning that the deposit- depositors themselves are going to have to make up for the losses of the bank. And this is what what uh, you know. I think it's it's going it's going to happen. We are going to have a financial crisis, and we are going to be looking at bail-ins. And there was a, a conference, a G20 conference in Brisbane, actually. Yep. Um, Jim Richards was writing about that, where he finalized a lot of these laws. Uh, there's another proposal in the EU going through to uh, add some more specifics on how a bail-in is going to play out. So there's going to be some of these shocks, and these shocks, uh, are they're going to try to contain them with bail-ins. But if they're not able to contain it, or if somehow that shock is going to reduce the trust in other banks, then, you know, you, you're again going to have the whole system collapsing. So everything comes back down to trust. And, you know, um, I'm a, quite a fan of Jim Richards, of his books in UK's for Gold, which right. he, he did a really good job kind of, I think, describing the financial system. And in it, he gives the examples that it's like people watching a movie. If one person runs out of the theater, you know, so other people are going to say, well, that's a weird guy. He must be running to the toilet or something. Uh, but if four people run out, people take notice, you know, so I'm a bit uneasy. Now, if 10 people are starting to run out, chances are so it's going to be the 11th and 12th person who's going to run out, not knowing why. It's just that these 10 people maybe know something. Maybe there's a bomb. Maybe there's something else. I, I better join them. And if the 11th and 12th person runs out, there's going to be 13, 14, 15, 16, because every person sitting in that theater is going to have a different threshold. Hmm. And that's when a stable system, which is the people watching the movie, suddenly turns unstable. And that's how the financial system is. Now, I give you an example of how this can play out. One example was, you know, the Italian bank, for example, infecting other banks. But, uh, you know, I just heard at deadlines that Trump is looking at, at you know, maybe imposing some uh, trade restriction on China again. Now, when he was being, uh, he was candidating, he was saying about something along the lines of putting a 30, 40 percent uh, import tax on Chinese goods. Mm-hmm. Now, if he really were to do this, the Chinese might end up retaliating, <laughs> and they might end, end up dumping U.S. dollars. Absolutely. Now, if the, if the Chinese start dumping U.S. dollars, that might not be that big a problem in itself. But it might cause other countries to join, because if the Chinese say, you know, I I rather sell my dollars and I buy something else with it because it's going to start falling in value, then the other countries who see China officially selling U.S. dollars, they might want to sell before China does, because the last kind selling it is going to get the least amount of it. You see, so suddenly, because so many countries have U.S. dollars, that chain of reaction can suddenly create a big currency crisis. And if the United States ends up with a currency which falls very, very quickly, it can take a life of its own, which is what happened in Germany in the 1920s during hyperinflation when money became worth almost nothing. Um, we didn't have hyperinflation in Germany because we printed too much money. I mean, that was that happened before, but the really that created some inflation, but what created hyperinflation was the fact that people didn't trust the money anymore. Because initially, they thought, I have some money, I'm going to save it because tomorrow is going to be a rainy day. And when people have that mentality, value, cash has value. Hmm. But in Germany, people started saying, well, prices keep on going higher and higher. Maybe I ought to be buying some extra food today or some cans of tuna to put away because tomorrow those cans of tuna are going to be more expensive. The shopkeeper... It's going to say, well, more and more people are buying all my tuna. I'm going to increase prices now instead of tomorrow. And so as they, uh, then you get that cycle mm. because price is going up faster. People go in and want to buy stuff before it goes up more, which causes the shopkeepers to price up higher and so on. And so that's how in Germany, in the span of you know six months, uh, we had you know a beer which might cost one or two papier marks ended up costing hundreds of millions. And people's life savings were wiped out. People's life insurances were all wiped out. 
So it was nothing to do with being able to predict it or mathematical formulas based on how much money was printed, how much gold there is, or any of these things. It was all a stable, which was a system which was stable, which reached that tipping point and suddenly became unstable. And it had a, um, uh, it was reinforcing itself basically. And it was all because of trust. And trust is not something you can measure or model very well. It just depends on, you know, psychology. Human psychology, exactly. Right, and you said, you know, you studied psychology. So, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I used to ask a stockbroker once in my early days when I wanted to work as a stockbroker. I asked him, if I want to be a stockbroker, should I study finance or marketing? He said psychology. Yeah. And so that was a good advice, actually. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, that's what it comes down to. You know, we can't reduce human behavior to numbers. It, it won't work. And then, and it, you know, that's that's perfect because essentially the global financial system is a is wooden jenga pegs that somebody's squirting lighter fluid on, and not only it's going to fall, it's going to light a blaze and burn down anyway. And you're in the business of protecting people's wealth, uh, with, you know, with gold and silver. Um, I I believe that you know your, your company accepts Bitcoin. For, for those people out there who are sitting on 10x gains, getting something physical in your hands or stored in a safe jurisdiction, here's your opportunity. So, Gregor, uh, we've been at this for 45 minutes. I appreciate you coming on. I don't want to, I, I don't want to be respectful of your time. I don't want to take any more of it. Um, maybe we can, you know, speak again soon or in the future. Uh, it sounds like you're a great, you know, monetary historian or you know it anyways. And it's, that's awesome. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, tell people how to find you, if you're any social media or just your company in Singapore. How can people contact you and, and preserve their wealth? Yep. Um, well, I think the easiest way is you go to, to our website. It's www.silverbullion.com.sg. So the .sg stands for Singapore. Um, or you can just Google us, you know, you put Silver Boy in Singapore, you'll find us. Uh, we've got quite a lot of materials, articles I've been written about, you know, some of the things we discussed on, on the show today for people to to look at. But you'll find all kind of links from, from that site, including videos of our storage facilities and so on. And I'll make sure I'll add uh, your website and uh, you're also a, a YouTube channel. Uh, I'll put those into the show notes so you can click on those and uh, find out the kind of products and services they offer at Silver Bullion in Singapore. My wife loves Singapore. She's been there. I haven't. Now we have an excuse. Or at least yeah, come, come, come by. We'll show you the world. We'll give you the tour. And we'll show you how, to, how bullion gets tested. Oh, man, that'll be great. Gregor Gregerson of Silver Bullion. Thank you for stopping by. Everybody, check out his site. Check out his business. Um, preserve your wealth, people. It, it's perilous out there. You can't wait till the thing happens to buy your silver. You you want to have it all locked down because when it happens, they won't be selling it. So, uh, well, for, you know, the idea is even even if everything is fine and you know says no financial crisis, you can't go too wrong owning a bit of gold and silver. It, it will go up in value over a long term for sure. So, and that's for it's you. a very cheap insurance right and, that, and that's for you and your and your, your children or your family so gregor thanks for coming on and i'll talk to you soon yep take care let to be here